Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Practical Tips to Manage Laboratory QC Data. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. This educational web seminar is sponsored by BioRad Laboratories. I want to invite everyone to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and click send. Any questions we do not have time for during the webinar will be captured and responded through the Q&A list that will be posted next week in the event resource box, which is located below the ask a question box. You will also be able to download the presentation handouts from this event resource box starting on May 20th. If you have any technical trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply contact us through the Ask a Question box and we'll be able to address those issues. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free PACE continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right hand corner of your presentation window and follow the instructions to obtain those credits. So let's get started. I want to introduce our presenter today, Dr. James Nichols. Dr. Nichols is a professor of pathology, microbiology, and immunology, the medical director of clinical chemistry and point of care testing at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He is a board certified in both clinical chemistry and toxicological chemistry by the American Board of Clinical Chemistry. Dr. Nichols' research interests span evidence-based medicine, information management, laboratory automation, point of care, testing, and toxicology. Dr. Nichols is currently also the president-elect of the Clinical Laboratory Standard Institute, or CLC, uh, CLSI, and has been a member, shareholder, and advisor of several CLSI document development committees. For a complete biography of Dr. Nichols, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Nichols, welcome. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Well, thank you for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about practical tips to manage laboratory QC data. The objectives today, I'm going to review quality control data for shifts and trends. We're going to critically assess laboratory performance against peers and I'll show you how to do that. And we're going to identify the danger of making frequent QC adjustments. Much of what I'm going to be discussing comes straight out of um, CLSI C24, the Statistical Quality Control for Quantitative Measurement Procedures, Principles and Definitions, that was published by CLSI in 2016. Now I'd like to start with some definitions. Quality assurance is that entire umbrella of all of the activities that we do in the laboratory in the pre-analytic, analytic, post-analytic post phases to promote excellent outcomes in medical care and good quality test results. Quality control is just a component under that quality assurance umbrella, but it's an integral part of uh, the aggregate of processes and techniques that we do to detect, reduce, and correct deficiencies in an analytical process. Quality improvement, on the other hand, is benchmarking. Benchmarking our performance and continually assessing and adjusting our performance using statistically and scientifically accepted procedures. Now, the ISO definition 5.6.2.1 from ISO 15189 indicates that the laboratory shall design internal control systems that verify the attainment of intended quality of test results. Special attention should be paid to the elimination of mistakes in the process of handling specimens, requests, examinations, reports, and other parts of the total testing process. Documentation should include quality control procedures based on the manufacturer's instructions for use or the package insert. Internal quality control by this definition is that liquid QC, that uh, those processes and uh, analysis that we do in the laboratory that's internal 
to our laboratory, as opposed to proficiency uh, testing, which I'll describe later in this talk. Internal quality control is defined as that set of procedures undertaken by the laboratory staff for the continuous monitoring of operation and the results of measurements in order to decide whether we release results and whether they're reliable enough for patient care. The regular analysis of quality control materials serves as an essential component of our laboratory's internal control system. Now, used to be we would test patient samples in batch. We would put quality control before and after those patient tests uh, samples, and we would test them as part of this batch. We'd hold results until we finished the total run analysis, and then we would release those results. Now we're dealing with automated systems uh, where we have tracks, where uh, these tracks move samples around between analyzers, and everything is continuously released in process. So as soon as we analyze a sample, we're releasing those results to the clinicians. So the modern laboratory is very much run like a factory. And as part of this, we have to ha adopt quality control processes and think much more in the factory model. Now, historically, quality control was born in the 1900s, industrial models of quality in the analytical process. In a factory, we're building airlines or uh, car parts, and we're looking as these uh, parts come down or the automobile is coming down the factory line, we're inspecting it to make sure that it meets certain manufacturer specifications. As we do with laboratory testing, we're adding samples called quality control that are tested very much like a patient sample, and the results of those are then uh, analyzed to uh, determine that the analytical system is achieving the desired result, that it, the quality control result is within pre-specified uh, limits. If it is, then our system is stable, and we assume we're producing quality patient results. Now some definitions I wanna go through. Accuracy or trueness are descriptions of the extent to which our measurement results approach the true value. And the parameter of accuracy that we measure is bias or difference from truth. Precision, on the other hand, is reproducibility on the repeated measurement of the same sample. Standard deviation is our parameter of measurement for precision. If we randomly uh, analyze a specimen repeatedly over time, all of those results should scatter around a mean and within two standard deviations of that mean, form a bell-shaped curve. In other words, 95% of the data under this bell shape or Gaussian distribution should fall within two standard deviations of the mean. Three standard deviations is about 99.7% of the data. So most of our quality control ranges are set up to plus or minus 2SD as is our reference intervals and other aspects of what we do in the laboratory. We use the two standard deviation ranges in uh, uh, quality control for setting up and estimating future performance. In other words, we can measure over a period of several days a particular quality control sample, achieve a mean, and a range of data around that mean. And within two SDs, we can predict future performance if we continue to analyze that sample or samples from that same quality control lot. So if we plot these, we can see most of the samples on this plot here fall within the mean is the black, big black bar in the middle, 3.48 for this glucose. And most of the plots within the first half of this uh, graph fall within plus or minus two standard deviations, the, the orange dashed bars. 
However, somewhere around the middle of the plot on day 16 to 17, we see a shift where we have that red uh, uh, box. And that allows us visually to see a shift or trend in our data and to take corrective actions as appropriate. Now, traditionally, we have set up multi-QC rules um, to determine whether our uh, analyzer is stable and releasing good quality patient test results, or whether we need to stop patient testing and take corrective action. Rules such as 1-2-S are set up more as warning rules because, remember, 95% of the data under that bell-shaped Gaussian curve falls within plus or minus 2-SD. But we have those outliers of 5% just by random chance. That's one out of 20 uh, test results could just randomly be due uh, to chance. So. If, however, we have a 1-3-S failure, our quality control outside of 3-SD, that's very improbable that it's random. And this must be some shift in the performance of our test system. Because a 1-3-S, three standard deviations, encompasses 99.7. So randomly, only one out of 300 test results would fall outside of those limits. So we're looking more at some type of shift or an inaccuracy or imprecision within our test method. And we can apply other types of uh, rules, such as 2-2-S, uh, 4-S, where four consecutive points exceed one standard deviation, or even 10 consecutive points on one side of the mean. The selection of rules that a laboratory uh, uses depends on your quality uh, goals and the tolerance you have for troubleshooting. If you set them too tight, you will overcall many, many failures and be troubleshooting the method more than you need to. In other words, false alarms. If you set the ranges too wide, you uh, the method will not be sensitive to picking up big shifts or trends that could affect patient uh, results. So you want just that right range. And the methods that different laboratories utilize varies. There is no one right way or wrong way to address uh, troubleshooting and setting up your targets. But I'll give you some tips based on C24 to help assist with this uh, throughout this talk. You may be familiar with Westgard's uh, chart for troubleshooting um, and determining whether quality control is in range or out of range and whether it is acceptable to continue to release results or to stop testing and troubleshoot. Now, it's important that we look at our quality control data. Continuously, as we run quality control, whether it be periodically every so many hours or so many patients on a continuous run, every 20, 50, 100 patients, de depending on the performance of that assay, it's important that bench techs look and assess that quality control performance as soon as the results are available. So they should verify that QC is recorded in an electronic system. If it is outside of limits, they should stop patient testing troubleshoot failed quality controls, and document their corrective actions. If necessary, because we're releasing results continuously on our automated platforms like hematology and chemistry analyzers, we want to go back and do a patient look back since the last previous good QC or acceptable in-range quality control. We also want to check for shifts and trends. In other words, has our uh, quality control data shifted very close to the 2SD or 3SD limits, whichever rule your laboratory is using, and is just hovering there, which may indicate that there's been some change in performance since we initially set up those target ranges. We then want to ensure that there is a periodic review by the leadership of the laboratory. Lead techs, managers, ensuring that uh, the bench techs have documented failures and investigation of those failures, and that patient 
lookbacks are documented and action taken, correcting uh, results if necessary. They also want to look for assay bias, precision, and shifts in trends. And the medical director should sign off on these, at least on a monthly basis or periodically, depending on the policies of that laboratory and your local regulations. You should be looking at the QC charts, looking to make sure that troubleshooting has been documented and uh, assess performance against your peers. We put out in our laboratory and post a troubleshooting table to assist our bench techs in how to troubleshoot out of range QC. First, we recommend going back and repeating the quality control. And this isn't just the level that failed. If we're running two or three levels of QC, we want the entire event to be repeated and make sure that all three of those levels, if we are running three level, multiple level QC, is within range. If it is, we can stop troubleshooting. If not, we can go on and look to uh, a fresh package of reagent from the same lot. We should then be checking for calibration. When was the last time the assay was calibrated? Is it very close to outdating or has the calibration expired? We also want to look to, um, uh, after uh, calibration, maybe changing reagent lots or checking for other calibrator lots before we uh, go on to looking at instrument maintenance, troubleshooting the analyzer uh, as parts and calling the manufacturer in for repairs. So this is a general uh, overview of how to approach troubleshooting out of range QC. As I review QC um, as the medical director, I'm looking for shifts out of control QC that detect unstable performance because this then leads to the possibility for reporting erroneous patient results. The first step I want techs to do anytime they have an out of range data, I want them to stop patient testing and troubleshoot. As I'm looking at the monthly uh, report, I'm looking at graphs, I, I look for shifts uh, which is a sudden change in the QC. Um, I'm also looking for trends where it's downward or upward, and uh, downward as I've circled here in this plot. So a trend occurring gradually over time in reagent or control degradation, kind of a, a point uh, pinpointing that this may have occurred, or a sudden shift where we may have shifted lots or we may have recalibrated that caused a shift in the performance of our analyzer and test method. Now many factors can cause errors in test results. Um, reagent degradation, which uh, exposure to temperature, light, humidity. Calibrators and controls can go bad as they're stored, even in the refrigerator, or after we open a bottle and we repeatedly utilize the liquid in that bottle, it can be exposed to air. The Analyte can shift in stability over time. So if we repeatedly run quality control out of a single vial over time, um, we can see degradations in performance due to evaporation or even analyte stability. So we need to think about how many times can we utilize a bottle of QC or even a calibrator after reopening it can those calibrators be refrozen and rethawed, which may affect performance as well? Instrument maintenance is important to keep up daily, weekly, monthly, periodic, semi annual, and annual maintenance needs to be done as specified by the manufacturer in their instructions for use, but also if you have a very high volume throughput of specimen samples, you may need to up the frequency of your maintenance because you may see wear and tear and failure of parts before the manufacturer recommended maintenance cycle. Personnel, we have to think about training, competency. Is, are they operating the analyzer correctly and are they making inadvertent mistakes? How can we prevent those in the training process? Now, laboratory errors come in two flavors. Systematic errors lead from a shift in performance or a bias from one point forward in time. 
can be a problem with calibration, uh, incorrect set points of the calibrators, the standard that was used, uh, reagents, blanks, controls. Random errors, however, occur with a single sample and are not persistent in time. Things like uh, clots, bubbles, drug interferences, or hemolysis, for instance, in that sample. Now, systematic errors are easier to detect with quality control because the analyzer performance affects the quality control sample the same way it affects patient samples with these persistent errors over time or shifts in performance. However, a random error occurs with one single sample, and that's much more hard, uh, harder or insidious to detect with the quality control. As we think of our corrective actions, think of making it simple for your technologist and for the management team. Have charts like I showed earlier, or diagrams like this in your policies and procedures to methodically address key sources of analytical performance, such as quality control first, then addressing reagent, then calibrator, then the potential for analyzer breakdown or operator error. Do these one at a time as you troubleshoot, and that will allow you to systematically come in to the source of that problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Once the source is discovered and the issue is resolved, you should look back at patient uh, results since the last good QC or in-range result performance to ensure that patient uh, results that were released were correct and that you don't need to correct a result and contact a physician. As I review through our quality control, I'm looking for shifts in a single level of QC. Here you can see very close to the mean performance at the beginning of the chart, leading to a shift, almost 1SD, near the middle of the chart. Step behavior, where we see sudden shifts up and then down in performance, or shifts in all three levels of quality control. Here you can see a decrease in the ranges for all three levels. We also can look for changes in performance because not all of our problems are shifts in bias. We could see increased imprecision in our method. And here you can see right around where that black line is in the first an abrupt change in the precision of our method. We look for things where we have stable performance and suddenly now seesaw performance where you may have two bottles of the same reagent on the analyzer at the same time, but because they're calibrated at different time points, they have different biases. So your QC shifts from up, down, up, down, um, as you do the QC events. Or you can look for just generally poor performance. Now, <clears throat> we also look for incorrect comments and uh, incorrect address um, troubleshooting comments from our techs where they have accepted um, uh, uh, out of range QC when it should have been a failure and they should have troubleshooted this. Such as accepting a 1-2-S warning, but it's actually a 2-2-S because it followed a 1-3-S. So it is outside of 2-S successively. Uh, frequent 1-2-S warnings with no action as an issue shows that we may have had a shift in that QC close to being out of range and the text will accept it when it's in range but the very next analysis of that QC it's out of range and they're troubleshooting again. This means we really should be troubleshooting system performance and not just trying to squeak the QC back in. Or you may have an incorrect comment such as uh, a two 1-2-S warning followed by another level of QC also being outside on the next performance and analysis. Again, uh, another definition of 2-2-S. We also want to look for bias to the mean in all three levels of our quality control. 
such as here, where we see a shift up in all three levels over a period of time. Now, I mentioned patient look back. Let's talk about that a little bit closer and in more detail. Patient look back is when we retest patients. We've had a failure in our QC. It's out of range. We're troubleshooting it. We fixed whatever the problem is. Now we want to go backwards in time and make sure that all of the patients we resulted since the previous QC were acceptable. You, if you do a high volume of testing, you may want to start with every 10th or 20th patient. Just looking backwards in time, am I recovering the same test result or is it significantly different? Um, if we find differences, we may have to go back and correct that result, contact the physician. Hopefully we have the sample because we detect it right away. But if we're reviewing a week later, samples have been uh, um, eliminated or discarded, we may need to comment that result, contact the physician and let them know that the result, uh, the sample is no longer available for retesting, that they should review the clinical uh, relevance of that uh, test and look at it and suspect it as potentially being incorrect. So look at clinical correlation in other words. Now, part of a quality management system is quality control. And we focus on fulfilling those quality requirements in the laboratory. What are those quality requirements? They're specified by total allowable error or biologic variation for a particular analyte. If the measurement error exceeds a patient result and the total allowable error, that result fails to meet patient care needs or quality requirements of the laboratory. So our quality of the testing process, QC, ensures that the analytical variability meets the accuracy and precision requirements established for that test are always appropriate for patient care. Now, defining total allowable error versus total analytical error. Our total allowable error is the medical utility, the biologic variation of that analyte, glucose, sodium. The total analytical error is our method error um, in this TAE versus TEA. Now, medical usefulness should be wider and must be greater than the analytical performance of our method. Otherwise, the test is not meeting patient care needs. In other words, our total analytical error is our bias and two times our standard deviation or our coefficient of variation. Now, our total allowable error is determined from medical decision points and biologic variability. This biologic variability, we can look up in, uh, there's references and consensus guidelines for this. One of the most recent ones here is the RICOS standard, where you have biologic variation and desirable analytical specification for different analytes, either um, serum, urine, plasma in this table. Now, Total analytical error is our uh, TAE, is our bias and two standard deviations. And it's um, a, a Gaussian curve around the mean uh, performance of that analyzer for a given test. And you can see here, it's a bell-shaped blue curve. The mean of that curve is the blue line, and the true value or truth is the big black bar. So we have systematic error, which is our bias, and we have random error, which is the range or the, the width of that bell-shaped curve. We want our total allowable error to, in the red bars to be much wider than the analytical performance of our analyzer in this bell-shaped blue curve. Otherwise, uh, uh, we aren't meeting clinical performance. So having a much wider 
biologic variation or total allowable error allows our analytical performance to shift slightly from one day to the next or one calibration to the next calibration without going outside of our allowable limits. Okay, our quality control ranges should be based on the observed instrument variability rather than manufacturer recommendations. A lot of the ranges that are distributed in the package insert are much wider than even biologic variation for that particular test. So glucose, for instance, a normal control in the manufacturer package insert might be 50 to 150 milligrams per deciliter. But our analyzer with a performance of 1.5% CV gives us an overall, if we estimate zero bias, overall total analytical error of plus or minus 3%. This means if we repeatedly measure that quality control sample and get a value of 100, our 2SD range is going to be 97 to 103 for that particular quality control. Biologic variation for glucose, on the other hand, is closer to 7%. So you can see that our analyzer total analytical error is much tighter than the total allowable error of 7%. And both of these are well within manufacturer uh, suggested ranges of 50 to 150 for this given control. This is why a laboratory performing quantitative um, uh, quality control uh, statistical procedures wants to set their own target ranges based on their test system performance, rather than just adopt what's in the package insert. Now we do need to be concerned about commutability because oftentimes the suggested quality control target ranges in the package insert are based on multiple different analyzers, either models of analyzer and even different manufacturers. Quality control materials, remember though, contain stabilizers and preservatives to extend the shelf life of that material and the stability of that analyte in the, in the matrix. This alters the matrix of quality control samples compared to um, biological samples. And they may behave differently than patient samples. So CLSI recommends analyzing new QC lots once a day at a minimum for 10 days. There's also EP05 that notes that 20 days of performance may be required to get a better estimate of all the different contributions from periodic and occasional sources of variability that contribute to a measurement procedure's long-term performance. Ultimately, it comes up to the laboratory director. And this is where I mentioned that individual laboratories may set their ranges slightly differently. They may uh, validate new lots a little bit differently as well. So it is clearly up to the medical director and based on your uh, experience with a particular product, you may shorten your verification when you get new lots in. It can be either 10, 20, it's at the determination of uh, the medical director. And some analytes have much more stable performance than others, and so that may require a little bit longer uh, performance. Um, before you set your new ranges. Now, ultimately, over time, we want our quality control supply to last long enough that we can actually get a good estimate of test system performance. We want to look at multiple uh, calibrations, the effect of changing reagent lots, environment, um, maintenance, even seasonal differences in our analyzer from winter to summer, uh, humidity and temperature variations in the laboratory can affect certain analyte performances. So we want our supply to be stable enough over a longer term period of time to get a good estimate of whether our performance is in range or uh, shifting. Now, this brings me back to a case I remember taking over a laboratory where the lead tech in that area would move and change the QC ranges every month 
as part of their monthly review. They thought this was part of monthly review. But I'll tell you that frequent range adjustments sort of defeats the purpose of running quality control because you've set up an expectation that this particular control will fall within a particular range and you're estimating stable performance versus unstable performance and need to troubleshoot based on that range. If you consistently and continuously change the range every time you go through a review, that then is shifting your expectations of performance. And you really can't judge true performance of your analyzer. So you want to establish a historical performance over a longer period of time, several months, calibrations of reagent changes to detect and be sensitive to shifts and biases that may affect patient test results. So let's turn to a couple of examples before the end of this talk. Here we have a new homocysteine quality control lot, and we need to set new ranges. Our package insert has uh, ranges of plus or minus approximately 25 to 30 percent at the three levels of QC. We analyze an eloquat of each of these levels once a day for 20 days. We use the EP05 recommendation because we want to get some estimate of different operators different instruments in our laboratory, um, and different calibrations. <coughs> this is the result of this. So historically, over time, we've been running, and here you can see uh, current QC up in the upper right-hand corner. It, we are running at 9% at 7.7, and the high QC is 6%. Total allowable error um, uh, for this biological is 15.5%. We run this QC over 20 days on four different analyzers, so we get 80 points here. And these are our means um, in the upper left box here, 7.17, 13.13, So the new lot ranges have to take into account that um, the QC may be slightly different in terms of mean. But since we've had stable performance at this standard deviation, we want to keep the same CVs and adopt the new ranges. So we set our level one where the CV is the same, 7.2 plus or minus uh, 0.65. Uh, this is 9%, and that's still 9% CV, but the SD has changed a little bit down from 0.7 because the mean shifted. Level 2 QC didn't shift at all, means the same, so we keep the SD the same and the CV, 7.7%. And level 3, 26.12, is very close to 25. Uh, we kept the standard deviation the same, which narrows our CV just a little bit. So that's how we adopt uh, and, and verify a new reagent and set new ranges when we get a new lot of QC, what about a new lot of reagent? We pull some samples, measure them in the old lot and the new lot. So we're looking at patient samples that span the reportable range of that test. And we want to look at QC, old lot versus new lot of reagent. Here you can see five patients, old versus new lot, controls old versus new. And we can see that everything, um, reagent lot changes, shouldn't shift controls unless there's a matrix effect. Matrix effect would be something like the lower left box where you see a big shift in the high QC, no shift in the low QC when you adopt and implement a new uh, lot of reagent. Now, this is an interesting one. It's IgE. We have a level one QC. The new lot uh, was close to the lower limit of acceptance. 147 is our lower limit of um, that level one uh, QC. Uh, we got a level of 140 or 348. So um, you know, 347 versus 348, it's almost out. So do we accept this new reagent? or do we request a new lot of reagent? Well, because they only ran this once, I requested that uh, they go back, 
repeat the QC. This time it came up uh, much closer, uh, 382, towards the mean of 425 that we have set. And then to recalibrate and repeat QC, and lo and behold, it pops right onto the mean. So it was just an issue of randomly lying almost out, and on repeat, it came much closer to the mean, and then on recalibration, it's right at the mean. So don't always reject a reagent lot just based on the initial QC performance. Run it a couple of times. Try troubleshooting quality of your uh, calibrator and your repeating of the QC before you reject a lot. We have peer down here, and you can look at how our performance in the laboratory compares against peers over time. And I'll talk about that in a slide or two. Now, analyzers in our laboratory, say five chemistry analyzers, how do we set our quality control? Do we set an individual mean and range for each and every analyzer, which would give us analyzer one, say for instance, albumin, 2.44, Analyzer 2, 2.41, Analyzer 3, 2.40, Analyzer 4, 2.46, and so forth. Or do we set a group mean based on the entire laboratory, maybe slightly wider SD and CV, but it encompasses all of the, the analyzers? I would say it's easier for the technologist to set one mean and to, to keep that and think about it. But if you have smart, uh, technologies, your computer systems, you may be able to set more individualized analyzer performance ranges. You want to periodically review your means, SDs, CVs to ensure appropriate ranges, identify changes in method performance that may require corrective actions. Certainly investigate measurement procedures that have frequent QC failures Redetermine whether you've had a shift in the performance um, or a deterioration in your reagent or even the quality control material itself. So look to peers. Monitor the rate of QC rule rejections, your number of patient samples needing retesting. Review your analytical errors not detected using statistical QC to help you develop a better QC strategy. And better appropriate multi-quality control rules. Um, supplement your quality control with external proficiency uh, testing, or EQA, an external quality assurance program. This allows you to participate in inter-laboratory both uh, specimens that have a known value or that you're comparing to your peers as well as a laboratory quality control performance where you have multiple laboratories running the same lot of quality control that you can compare against because they're from the same manufacturer, assays, and analyzers. The benefits of these interlaboratory QC comparison is that your package insert quality control ranges are often very wide, cover many lots, different test methods and instruments. A quality control comparison provides peer group data, establishing QC ranges for new lots based on other laboratory performance, using your own methods. And it helps patients by assuring that your laboratory quality matches peers in the industry. Here's an example. This is for glucose hexokinase on an Abbott architect. Um, you can see that our lab performance, the month, and our cumulative for level one, two, and three is in the first columns in the middle of this table. The column next to it, uh, to the right, is the peer group, month, and cumulative. And the method group is all method manufacturers. So our cumulative laboratory performance is 55 compared to the peer group of 55.16. <coughs> and over this recent month, we've dropped down just a little bit to 54.84. So this allows us to compare on the same quality control, using the same methodology to our peers um, 
throughout the world. And the number of labs there was 38 labs uh, that were using the same methods, uh, same methods, same QC material. Now, we also want to look at setting our ranges too tight. We want to be careful because uh, we may be troubleshooting too often or too frequently, and this is a waste of resources. So part of a peer comparison is uh, readjusting, making sure that you're matching your means, uh, your peers out there. And not just that the mean is, is matching, but that your standard deviations or, or coefficient of variation uh, in terms of the width of your ranges is reasonable. Here we have a low level TSH control. The month is a 0 0.58 uh, or 0 0.058. Uh, that gives us a, a CV of 3.11%. Our cumulative is about 4.49. So uh, we're running a little bit up from our cumulative. That's 0 0.0556 on this particular analyzer. We have a set point of 0 0.055. So our cumulative is very close to our set point, so a little wider, you can see 5.45. But when we look at the peer report, um, we're seeing our peers are running closer to 12%. Now that's expected because you have more labs, more variability, the more analyzers you group into this pool. But it also makes us scratch our head, are we clearly less than half of our peers? Uh, do we have that tight of performance? Given that biologic variation for TSH at this level is closer to 30 to 40 percent. So we're a sixth of biologic variation and a clear half of our peers. So we may be too tight. Um, you know, we've done multiple troubleshooting, recalibration, maintenance, but the QC is still running high. So the next step to reconsider is really changing the set point across all of our analyzers. We had four or five analyzers that were running TSH. We set the set point to the mean of those and adjusted our CV upwards to closer to 10%, which made it closer to um, our peer group. And now look at the plot. You can see that many of these outliers in red dots that we had been troubleshooting before were really within reasonable performance for that particular methodology. And we probably were over troubleshooting with this. So it's something to always keep in mind and consider. I'll remind you that quality control data, ISO 15189, the laboratory shall have a procedure to prevent the release of patient results in the event of a quality control failure. This is what I've been describing troubleshooting as well as review on a monthly basis or periodic basis to make sure that your QC is in range and you're matching your peers. Bi-directional communication with LIS, your laboratory information systems and other middleware allows the laboratory to prevent the instrument from releasing suspicious results. You can place your samples on hold until the error has been corrected and troubleshooted fix the analyzer and the method performance. You can also be traceable uh, in, through your middleware to indicate when your last valid QC was added help you in patient lookbacks. And the laboratory shall also evaluate the results from patients that were examined after the last successful quality control event. So programs like BioRAD, uh, Unity, Realtime can assist you in compliance with ISO regulations and even CAP and CLIA regulations in the United States. I'm going to close by wrapping up with some QC take home messages. Do calculate your own quality control limits from your lab data. Don't necessarily utilize what's in the package insert. Use computer and statistics to analyze and interpret quality control data and select QC procedures to detect medically important errors. Define your total allowable error and your error budget for each test. Hold patient samples when controls go out of range. Troubleshoot the root cause of out of control conditions and fix those problems. Don't just 
repeat quality control until they come back in. Do review your QC regularly, daily, weekly, monthly. Comment your corrective actions and monitor your ongoing performance using interlaboratory quality control programs like BioRad uh, Bio Unity, but also external quality assurance programs like proficiency testing to make sure you're matching your peers. Don't adjust your QC too frequently. Wait till there's a scientifically valid reason. I want to thank you for your attention, and I will turn it over for qu uh, questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Nichols, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. Dr. Nichols, it looks like we already have some great questions coming in from our audience. Our first question, when starting a new QC lot, do you advise to use 10 or 20 data points to estimate your new mean? So CLSI recommends using at least 10 uh, points, so analyzing that quality control at least once a day over 10 days at a minimum. But if you want to get a better estimate, if this is a brand new control material that you don't have a lot of experience with, you want to see how it um, captures performance on multiple calibrations, uh, multiple reagent lots, multiple operators, you may need to analyze that quality control for a longer period of time, like 20 days or even longer. Thank you so much. And what is your recommended practice when an assay is statistically out of control, but within the total allowable error? So I talked a little bit, of, uh, gave a couple of examples of this. Um, clearly, you want it within the total allowable error. But uh, if you see shifts of performance outside of your predetermined quality control ranges, you need to troubleshoot that. Um, try repeating the QC. Look at uh, whether your reagent is at the end of the bottle. You may want to add a, a new pack or new bottle of reagent on the analyzer. Double check your uh, calibration. When was it last calibrated? Also look at instrument maintenance. Thank you so much, Dr. Nichols. And our next audience member wants to know, what West Guard rules do you recommend that we follow? It seems that one to twos is too restrictive. Sure, if you go one to two S, remember that the random chance of one in 20, 5%, um, will just randomly be outside of range. Um, so, you know, if you're using that as a failure, you're going to be troubleshooting a lot more frequently than if you used a, a wider range, like a 1-3-S type of rule. But you really need to tailor your quality control rules and pick your quality control rules to the method itself, the performance of that method. Is it a very stable method? You want to probably use wider ranges, maybe fewer rules. If it's very unstable, you see lots of frequent shifts, uh, it's uh, your techs are constantly troubleshooting the analyzer with that method. You want to maximize your quality control. And you can estimate this with sigma rules. Sigma, which is based on your total allowable error for that analyte, your precision, and your uh, truth or bias of that method. Those come together for a sigma. World-class sigma is six sigma for factories uh, and, and the industry. Um, if you are at Six Sigma, you can go with fewer quality control rules. If you are at lower Sigma, three uh, or lower, you want to maximize the number of rules that you use. Thank you so much. And I, I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. We have time for a couple of more. How often should you run QC events on point of care instruments? Sure, so it depends on the methodology. Number one, you have to follow manufacturer's recommendations, meaning looking at the frequency that's recommended in the package insert. That's at a bare minimum. 
but then you can go with a frequency that is based on your local requirements in uh, the United States. It's based on clear regulations, and you need to basically run quality control for non-waved methodologies, run at least two levels each day of patient testing. Or you can develop, a, through risk management, uh, an individualized quality control plan that will allow you to reduce the frequency of QC in lieu of some built-in or internal processes that are present on a lot of our uh, point-of-care testing methodologies. So it's dependent on the method, dependent on your local regulations, but uh, typically it is a minimum QC once a day or using an alternative like risk management to reduce that frequency to weekly, monthly. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. If the controls and analyzer are from the same company, can we use the ranges that are pre-printed that came with those controls? Keep in mind, those quality control ranges cover multiple, probably models of analyzer that one manufacturer may be uh, uh, releasing or supporting, um, even though they are matched from the manufacturer with that particular models and, and makes of analyzers. So those are usually much wider than are acceptable for clinical performance. And they really set more as this is the target that you should be shooting for where those quality controls should fall, but then each laboratory should really be determining their individual ranges based on their specific analyzers and the specific lots of reagents and calibrators they're using. Dr. Nichols, I want to thank you for your time today and for your important research. And before we go, I also want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their questions. And questions we did not have will be answered and posted in the event resources by May 28th. And this webcast will be available on demand in the auditorium from Thursday on. If you found this informative and helpful, please share it with your colleagues. For the next webinar on June 30th, we will have Dr. Lauren Bachman from Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center presenting best practices to recover from an out of control event. Please stay tuned and watch your email inbox for the invitation. Until next time, take care and stay healthy, everyone. Bye-bye.